A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. What power of breath do you think you used on a scale from one to ten right there? Wow. It seemed controlled. It seemed like you had good control of that Monica. I mean, that's all that this is about, dude, is control of breath. That's all a harmonica is about. So what was that, like a two or three? Yeah, that was only like a two or three. If I did anything above I, like a four a or rip? five, I mean, it would absolutely it wreck the rip. audio. It just <laughs> <laughs> um, We'd flatline. It's actually interesting. Harmonicas, if you don't know anything about music, this may mean nothing, but like there's keys in music, you know, A through G, and there's sharps and flats. A harmonica is just in a key. So you're not like necessarily playing like, I don't know, it's just... So there's different harmonicas for different keys? Yeah, like you have to have a harmonica for the key that your song mm. is in. Um, so sense. I could literally just put my teeth down on this and play guitar and just breathe in and out, and it would sound like I was like you knew doing, doing something with a harmonica. Yeah, like like hey, not to anyone who knows <laughs> anything about harmonica, but it could sound like it goes yeah. along with something. Um, Tell Two Cities, Charles Dickens. So this is obviously an extremely popular book. It's a classic. It's got almost a million ratings on Goodreads, 923,000 with a 3.87 overall rating. Um, I know we contributed to its its downfall. Yeah, I gave it a. I'm confused. What I did gave I it give a three. It? I think yeah. you gave it a three as well. Yeah, I gave it a three. Um, I mean, I first feel bad thoughts. though. Like thinking about how, and this is why I hate a five point scale system, I and mean, we talk about this often. Yeah. We almost should come up with our own rating system just so that we have more consistency. But anyway, because it's like, so you rated The Silent Patient a three, and then you rated A Tale of Two Cities a three. And I feel like, obviously, there's different reasons for that. Like, you may have had, like, I'm sure Silent Patient was more of a page turner than Tale of Two Cities. But, but Tale of Two Cities as, is a better book. Like, as far as, like, yeah, literature yeah. and, like, how he sets it up. I mean, did I understand how, he, like, what was happening as I was reading it? No. If I would have, I think I would have. You know what I mean? I, I think I would have appreciated it more, but you I know, should probably go back and give Silent Patient a two, honestly. As we really, yeah, I probably should. But anyway, continue. I'm sorry. Yeah, but it's just there are factors, though. I mean, like you said, it was a page turner. Like you quickly read it. It wasn't like it lingered on. So I mean, yeah, it's not like you didn't finish it. Like, yeah. So I mean, maybe three is accurate. It's just there's different. Yeah, there's Criteria different things. Four yeah. to three. That's a different yeah. three than this three. So you lose tough. stars based on different things. Yeah. I, um, and, you know, it is what that is. But anyway, so do we want to start with just like, we can just go through like the story with how it unfolds and then talk about characters as they're introduced? Yeah, before we do that though, like, so I listened to this almost completely on Audible. Um, I read maybe three or four chapters total, but most of it I was listening to like driving to and from jobs at work. Um, and just overall, dude, I, we've talked about this some, but for the sake of the podcast, I'll say like, I was kind of lost, like in a bunch of different parts of this book. There's just like a lot of different characters. Like it's just that old English style of writing, like just kind of lost me a few times. Like I understood the premise of it and understood what was going on, but there were several moments where I was like, what are they talking about? Like, what are they talking about right now? Yeah. I don't know. Um, the hardest part is that there's, there could be two characters that you're watching interact, and he may not call them by, like, the names that you know them by. Like, yeah. he could call one the prisoner instead of Darnay. Right. Or he could call one of them, like, Jacques or instead of, you know, so it's like you really have to pay attention, and I feel like that's probably hard to do with Audible. Yeah. Of like, okay, wait, who are these two characters right now? Because yeah. he's not always going to say their name. He might yeah. use some sort of pronoun to, or or like some proper noun to address them as instead of their name. So if you're not keeping up with what's going on, yeah. you're like, wait, who was that? Like, yeah. and so Charles Dickens would have a field day with pronouns nowadays. Oh, dude, and yeah. But the premise of it is is essentially you're following like which I did really like this aspect. I love this era of history during the French Revolution. So the tale, the two cities in the tale of two cities are Paris, France, and London, and Great Britain uh, during the time of, well, leading up to, and then during, and then a little bit after, or really, I guess, just before and during the French Revolution. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of, to me, was like a commentary on that time and how just fanatic people were during the French Revolution, during the terror, 
and all that stuff about anyone that seemed at all not super hardcore French Revolution ready to go. Um, so I thought that was really cool. Uh, just the setting. Um, I did enjoy that. Because again, I mean, I'm literally... It, I felt like it would be even more so this, but it did to a degree. I felt a little bit informed because I've been reading about the American Revolution, which happened <clears throat> not long before the French Revolution. And there were many founders, such as John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, who were pretty involved in the French Revolution from a distance. Or, I mean, they were both there in Paris at one point, at some points in history, um, before the French Revolution. And then during, I think one of them was there during, I can't quite remember, but either way, I felt like I was informed to a degree to have more of an appreciation for this, but I don't know, Charles Dickens, like this apparently is like his most different work, like the one that stands out from the others as being very different and like just the, the story itself, but also the writing style and like it not having like necessarily a main character, like kind of just following a few different people. Um, I do feel like there are main characters. Well, there are though. main characters, but there's not like a there's not really a protagonist and an antagonist. There's like You don't think so? I mean, there are, but like you're not the way he sets it up and the way you're following so many different stories isn't strictly one and two. Like there's multiple different storylines going on. I mean, there's like six different characters you're following around. There's yeah. the two guys who love what's her name. There's yeah, but some the of them are minor couple. though, for sure. I, mean, I feel like it is like a normal story where there's like, I would say the storylines are obviously Darnay, and then his storyline gets interwoven with Lucy and her dad, and then obviously there's the, the Sydney. Well, Sydney, he's kind of minor though, you know. But he doesn't I mean, like have his but own he's chapters. Super, super important. He's important, but he's, and he's like got more the most those gag. famous line from the book, dude. At the end, point before he gets killed. Yeah, dude. It's Hopefully f- no one's, I mean, not, this book's been out for 120 years, so. Yeah, sorry. I mean, we're not doing non-spoiler, really. I anyway, mean, but I would just say that the Charles Darnay, the, I mean, obviously, like, the the messenger guy, what was his name, Jack? Jerry Croucher, uh-huh. and then the Defarge, like, situation with her and her husband. Defarge. But, um, I mean, yeah, it, it's more just, dude, because of the lack of, like, him saying who they are when they're talking, it makes it so much harder. And then, like, always before he intros a character, it seemed like, especially early on, like, there would be a completely, like, metaphoric chapter about these characters. And so that chapter, you have no idea what just happened. And then the next chapter would happen, you're like, oh, okay, I think I know. You don't fully know, but it's like, okay, I think I know what he was trying to hint at now that, like, I see these characters interacting. But it's like you're... In a constant state of, like, trying to, like, I don't know. I feel like if I read this book again now, I'd be like, oh, wow. Because, I mean, even just reading through what actually happens, I'm like, wait, that hat like, that, <laughs> like, that's actually a great, like, that's a great twist. How did right. I not know that? Like, to get into hard spoilers, so, obviously, this is probably terrible to do, but we're jumping, all right, to the, to the end. So, Darnay A gets imprisoned. All right, we'll go back and go to what led up to this. But this is, like, the most fascinating part to me. So Darnay gets in prison. He goes back to France because, lo and behold, his he is related to um, freaking uh, Marquis Evermond, who's, like, one of these guys. He's the dude in the carriage who runs over and kills a kid. And, dude, I never made that connection when apparently Charles goes to Paris or France, and talks to his uncle. Yes, I remember that part. And, like, I guess, like, curses at him. But I guess I'm still, and I read this part. Like, I audioed mm-hmm. probably 40% of it. I read, like, the first almost 200 pages. Then, I I mean, I got into a lull, so I audioed it, and then I read the last, like, four chapters. And, dude, I still didn't pick up, that like, what was going on. Because yeah. I feel like they didn't, net, I know I'm sure they used his name, but, like, they're just using other terms for stuff. So, like, I didn't get that that's who that was. Mainly probably because I didn't understand who Evermond was. Like, this marquee yeah. guy in France. Because they don't necessarily... I mean, I'm sure, again, they say it, but it's just not as obvious. You really have to pay attention to, like, yeah. the literary details. Or else yeah. you're going to miss some context clues for sure. Yeah. And he's not really coming around with those again. But 
you know, essentially him getting in prison and him getting out because of, like, the help from Lucy and her father, Dr. Marnay, or whatever. Yeah. But then they find that letter to where Mar- Manette is asked to come to the Evermon property to look at a girl who's been injured, but essentially she was raped by one of the Evermons. And um, then they imprisoned him because they didn't think that he was going to keep it a secret, whatever. Did you know that the child that comes out of that rape, do you know who that is? Bro, I'm going to be honest. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Dude, it's a wild, it's a great story. It's just like, the, the you have to grasp it first. This book made me feel dumb, bro. I'm not going to lie. And part of it for me in my defense was, I was I audibled 95% of this. Dude, it was. And it was a struggle, like I said, man. I read part it of it and was, I didn't know. I, like, it was a struggle. Like, I thought I had it down as far as audibling like listening to books while I'm working. Cause like Dracula, I, I audible yeah. most of that and I yeah. was locked in, bro. I know everything that happened. It's when a little I was more clear to cut. It. I feel like, and this one, I would just realize like after five minutes, I'm like, bro, what are they talking about? What is happening? Dude, when the book starts out, I was like, Oh, well that first I don't chapter, know what this book is, dude. Are they bringing someone metaphors? back to life? I was like, what's happening? Yeah. That, that first chapter was hard metaphors, dude, which I got that after a little bit. Yeah, After, after you that read point, a chapter, then it's like, okay, but you still have to stay locked in. And especially with audible, you have to be even more locked in than you were yeah. reading. Cause you're doing something else when right. you're listening to this you're also working so like but even when i was driving dude i would be like i'm about to run this car into a brick wall what is happening <laughs> um and i'm making it sound like it was horrible like i appreciated it throughout and i understood like okay this is like hardcore like good literature but as far as the story man i just like couldn't keep up at times bro whatever you just said i don't know what all you're right, talking so you want to start from the beginning then let's just, then just bro, let's just start it. from the beginning all right man. so this will end just up being a full-on happened. summary of a tale of two cities so i'll say i'll read like what i have here summary wise and then i'll be like all right i got that when i read it and yeah, or i'll tell you I did what not i got yeah that. that'll be fun you know? okay yeah, yeah, yeah all right so <laughs> it says you know i got the year is 1775 social ills plague for uh, both france and england so what Jesse just talked about the first chapter is super confusing, and then it goes into and it gets a little bit more explaining. Well, the, the first chapter is sick. It's just like oh, a, like the pro the preface. Yeah, like he's just kind of going back and forth, like talking about basically the epoch of the times. Yeah, like it's I agree. it's very cool. But that then the second cool. chapter, you're like, yeah, dude, what's happening? So essentially, Jerry Cruncher, which you don't know, that's who this is at the time. Mm-hmm. He is um, he works for Telson's Bank. He stops this mail coach. With an urgent message for Jarvis Lorry, which I don't even know if you get that that's who that is, but essentially there's three people in this thing. They're kind of sketched out about that because I guess it's like middle of the night. Maybe it's a robber. Maybe it's not. He hands him a letter, and all it says is recalled to life. So Lori ends up meeting up with Lucy Minette, who's a young orphan, come to find out her dad's alive, um, who's from France. Her dad was this doctor. He's supposed to be dead, but he's been discovered in France, so... Lori, this banker, um, escorts Lucy to Paris. They meet Defarge. So he's this wine owner, and he's also a former servant of Dr. Manette. And so he keeps him safe, like, up in, like, the upstairs above his, like, whatever. And that, so they, they pull up, and he's making shoes. So he's, like, this crazy old guy who's gone crazy. He's making shoes, doesn't really remember who he is because he spent 18 years in the Bastille. So you don't know why he was there. And, like, obviously the story ends up telling you why. But anyway, they end up, Lucy ends up taking her dad, her Lori and Lucy take her dad back to London. So, you meet. And I'll say that scene was emotional. Like, I, yeah. like, teared up during that. Like, I remember the house I was in inspecting, like, when that scene was going on. That was an intensely emotional scene because she meets up with her dad and, like, doesn't want to, like, give him too much like at once to like freak him out or put him in some catatonic state or whatever could possibly happen. So she's trying to like let him down easy and like, let him know, like I'm your daughter. Yeah. Cause he like, it takes him a while for him to come to his senses. And then once he does, it's kosher. But yeah, um, that was a really good scene. So I remember that understood what was going on. And you got, you kind of set the scene to see that, okay, Lori, He keeps talking about things like it's just business, it's not personal, which is the classic, like, whenever someone's, like, repeating a line like that, it's always the opposite of that. But he's trying to act like, oh, I'm not really a good person, I'm just doing this because of business, because he was saying Manette was, used to be one of his old clients. Um, So anyway, you do get a touch of, like, I feel like Lucy's character to where she's just 
loving, almost like the pure character. She's the one who can't do any wrong, loving, blah, blah, blah. All right, so then it, then it fast forwards. It's going to fast forward five years, and now you're looking at a trial with a guy named Charles Darnay, um, who ends up obviously becoming a main character. And so he stands on trial because he's accused of, of, accused of treason against um, the English crown. Um, and then you meet Striver, who's a lawyer, who's like kind of in and out, but I feel like his character is not as relevant. It's like tough to realize, do I need to remember this guy or not? But anyway, um, so he pleads Darnay's case, um, and then Sidney Carton comes in, which he ends up being important, and he assists in the case because essentially he's a lookalike for Darnay, and their whole point is that, like, for why they think it was him that was a um, spy is because, like, someone recognized him. And then they, like, bring in Sidney Carton, and it's like, oh, well, does this look like him too? And they're like, oh, well, yeah, I guess he does. But then you kind of learn through this that Darnay and Lucy met on a boat coming from Paris to England, or from France to England. And um, you can kind of see, like, the foreshadowing of, like, a love building there. Yeah. And then no, everyone has good things to say about Charles. But yeah. he's also a Frenchman, though, coming over. And just to pause right there, that scene, because I was grasping what was essentially going on there. I don't know if you ever watched Better Call Saul, but that whole scene in the courthouse reminded me of a scene from Better Call Saul where he, there's this defendant, um, or a plan, yeah, defendant on trial, and while he's being like questioned, uh, and there's another person, like a witness on, on the stand, like saying what this guy did, when Saul Goodman goes to cross question or whatever they call it, um, the witness, he's asking all these questions. He was like, so this is the man that you're talking about. And she was like, yeah, yeah, the witness. And he was like, okay, what would you do if I told you that the actual defendant is sitting in the back row right now and this man is a random paid actor? to be here which is technically legal malpractice so he got like in trouble for it in the show but anyway if you're a fan of Saul the Saul Goodman better call Saul show that's a classic name too though Saul Saul Goodman Goodman. Saul Goodman um so anyway yeah I understood what was going on with the scene and it kind of clicked with that so I was like okay so but you get this scene from Jerry Cruncher's perspective so it's his POV which you still don't really know who he is you don't realize that he's the guy who gave Lori the message when they're on that carriage ride that says we're called to life but anyway, he's just kind of a messenger guy. Um, his perspective, honestly, was kind of interesting to me, especially like the whole like him yelling at his wife because she was kind of religious, and mm-hmm. she just like seems to be trying to do the right thing, and he's just savage. <laughs> yeah. um, but anyway, um, classic misogyny. Exactly. So um, they bring on Lucy and Minette as like a a witness and they call him to the stand. Everyone has a lot of good things to say about Darnay. Obviously they think like for sure he's going to prison for this flip the script. He gets out scot-free. Um, anyway, so Carton, um, he's going to despise and resent Darnay. So Sidney Carton, the guy who's a lookalike, um, because he reminds him of uh, all that he himself has given up and might have been. I didn't necessarily catch this. I guess Carton's like a huge drunk, which I think yeah. I remember seeing that. Yeah. And he's jealous because he thinks already that Lucy is vibing with, with Darnay, and obviously, yeah. you know, he, he likes her. And, and it's not just him. It seems like everybody's enchanted by Lucy in the courtroom, and I picked up on that too that— yeah. The classic okay. Lucy scenario where a woman named Lucy is loved by multiple men, just <laughs> like the Lucy from Dracula. Exactly, and like the show, everybody loved Lucy. Mm, dude, you know Deep that's Cut. a great show. It is. My I used to watch that on TV. Land. Not personally, but like it would be on. My parents used to love TV Land. I used to watch like, I Love Lucy with exist? my mom all the time, like in, on Saturday mornings and stuff. Was it on TV Land? I mean, I don't remember. We had direct. I don't TV. even know if that channel exists. It's like where like the Andy Griffith show was on. Dude. One of the best um, shows of all time. Andy I mean, it Griffith. was all those, like, uh, G- Gilligan's Island. I never watched that one. That one was hilarious. I used to like that one as a kid. Anyway, like there's Mash, so many deep cuts. All that stuff. Mash was on there. There's some other, like, was it Love Boat or something? I don't know. There's there's a bunch of throwbacks. But anyway. Yeah. All right, so then it cuts again, and this is where it loses me. This chapter, like, I remember, but I like I couldn't contextualize it, like, with what I needed to get from it. Like, the information that was thrown at me. I didn't know what was important about it um, until, like, reviewing this. But So then it cuts to France, and you're given the POV of the Marquis Evermond, and so it's him in his carriage, and he runs down a plebeian child. Um, and this kind of shows you the attitude of the aristocracy 
I said that wrong. Um, aristocracy. Aristocracy. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote that down. And I was like aristocracy. <laughs> um, so it shows that the Marquis has no regret or remorse to the peasantry. Um, basically looks down on them. And then this is where Darnay um, shows up um, from England. And he's going to curse his uncle. So you find out that they're related. And again, I didn't catch any of this. That they were related. Like, I remember it. But like... I still just couldn't piece together Darnay yeah. and then, oh, this is the same Darnay. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, just, I remember it, but I didn't, same as you, I, I did not scene. put together, like, what was actually happening as far as the story was concerned. Exactly. So, um, he curses his uncle and the French, um, or, dude, say that word again? Aristocracy, there it is, for its abominable treatment of the people, and he's going to renounce his identity as Nevermond, um, and I don't remember this part at all. So, so later that night, the Marquis is murdered. Uh, the murderer has left a single note with a nickname adopted by the French revolutionaries, Jack, which, like, I remember that because they call everybody Jack. Um, Jacques. Jacques. So we have the Marquis introduced, and he gets killed, and I'm like, I don't even remember him getting killed, dude. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that at all, but nope. I didn't even remember that. So anyway, um, I guess now at this point in the story, we're supposed to have this information that, okay, Darnay is a faint, like, is a is from okay, a very... Darnay. Okay, Darnay. Is from a very successful family um, that's high up in in France. Right. Didn't grab any of that. So all I know is still Darnay, Lucy, maybe they're getting together. That's all I've gotten so far. I don't know the Darnay other stuff. Anyway, so it says a year passes and Darnay asks Manette um, for permission for him to marry Lucy. Um he tells him that, like, if he allows this, he's going to, like, tell him a secret. And I remember this part as well like the, it was kind of like a give and take thing like if he gives him lucy he gets something um again i still don't grasp that he's going to give up his identity as like uh him being a part of the higher up in france right um and uh so carton is going to pledge his love to lucy so there's sydney carton the drunk guy who also looks like darnay which i did get this um and lucy kind of denies him and then he's going to admit that his life is worthless but she's helped him dream of better, and so she kind of pledges herself. He pledges himself to Lucy, even though she's like nah, which she's like nah in a really nice way. I will say I remember yeah, that. Yeah, she is. He basically friend zones himself for life. Yeah, like exactly. voluntarily friend. Which we himself. talked about this. This is a classic trope of this genre. It's like man, chivalry really is dead. Is if. Basically, if one guy loves a girl and everybody proposes to her, it's like, oh, wait, you're the guy who, who got her to say yes? We're brothers now. It's I'll like, do anything for you it's like, because why? of her. <laughs> because she loves you and not me. And, like, nowadays— There's, like, like, no jealousy at all. It's crazy, bro. Well, it's not even jealousy. If a dude said that to me now about my <laughs> girlfriend, I would just be like, dude, are you okay? You need therapy, bro. There's, yeah. like, There's four lies. billion <laughs> other women in the world that you could be with. Like— <laughs> Calm down. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's crazy. But anyway, then it cuts to Jerry Cruncha and um, him going and seeing like a funeral uh, procession for a spy named Roger Cly. So I remember the funeral procession, but I don't necessarily remember that it was a spy. Um, and then later that night, he goes to like essentially rob the grave. And I do remember this because it's more from his son's POV because he tells his son he's going to yeah. go like fishing or something like that. Yeah. And his son follows him, gets scared, runs back. But anyway, um, yeah, so essentially that's kind of what happens with uh, Jerry. Then uh, and there's like no body in the grave, right? Yeah, there's no body there. Yeah. For this guy who's supposed to be a spy named Roger Cly, which, I mean, ends up being relevant later, but... And I did grab this. Like, I will say this was one of the few things I did it did grab. But anyway, uh, like, I kept it in my mind and was able to recall that information, and it mattered <laughs> one of the few times. Yeah. Um, so then in Paris, though, another English spy known as John Barsad drops into Defage's wine shop. Um, Barsad hopes to turn up evidence concerning the mounting revolution, which is still in its covert stages. So we have Madame Defage. She's kind of sitting there looking him over. Um, and getting kind of, am I good? Yeah, getting kind of sketched about him. So I do remember this because he comes in, tries to pretend like he's not a spy and he's clearly a spy. I remember that. Didn't really know what to do with that, but I remembered that. So then it kind of cuts forward. Darnay is on the morning of his wedding and he keeps his promise to Manette and reveals his true identity. And 
I did I don't I guess I kind of remember this. What I remember from this is that Manette relapses in into his old habit of making shoes after this, after he gives him this information. Which now, like, looking back, makes so much sense. Like, again, right. this is Dickens, like, really doing a good job with writing because maybe I don't know it. Like, I didn't know it while I was reading it, but I should have been able to recall that information later on when the big reveal happens with the letter, which you, I just explained to you, but you didn't even realize what had happened either, which, I mean, I was in the same mode. So it's just, I mean, all everything is there for a great story here. It's just, yeah. can you grasp it? Yeah. Um, so I anyway, don't know, dude. Like, it to comment if we're just dumb dude i felt dumb listening yeah. and reading this book because i was just like why am i not able i don't know if it's just because the writing didn't like grab me but like it was a way different style of writing how it is today so it's tough because we've read a lot but it's just everything's so much it it's so much clearer you know yeah it's like there's like this cloak and dagger style to this writing to where like i I don't know. I don't know if that's the right way to explain no, it. No, I it just feels yeah, like I know exactly like, what you're saying. Like Dickens is like purposefully like Hey, this is like gonna be a great book, but only happening. for the elites who uh, like yeah. intellectual. Elites. Like this should have been when I Google searched books for intellectuals, Tale of Two <laughs> Cities should have popped up because you're not gonna understand it unless you've got like a 400 IQ oh apparently, my gosh. or I'm just dumb. I don't know. So anyway, Manette, after hearing who Darnay is, which is a part of the Marquis, um, he you know goes back to making shoes. Um, Manette, Manette ends up being fine. Um, later on, like after they return from their honeymoon, then Carton, Cindy Carton comes back, vows his friendship to Darnay, as anyone does when the girl you love gets stolen from you. <laughs> um, and then he's like, yeah, you're, we're boys now. Uh, exactly. Um, so then, you know, we were just around 1780. We're going to jump to, and again, I didn't get these time jumps here. Like I got jumps, but I didn't realize like how far the jump was, but well, one of the title, one of the chapters is titled five years later. So that was like, I think to the, so this, we're about to jump nine years ahead. So oh, that so was from 75 to jump. 80. That's right. Yeah, that's now right. we're going from 80 to 89, which I didn't grasp this jump. This could have been the next day for me. But, um, anyway, so peasant. Peasants in Paris storm the Bastille, and the French Revolution begins. Um, revolutionaries murdy, murdy, murder aristocrats in the streets, and then a Gabelle, a man charged with maintenance of the Evermont estate, is imprisoned. Three years later, he writes to Darnay, asking to be rescued. Um, despite the threat of great danger, um, Darnay departs immediately to France. So, like... I don't really remember Gabelle. Like, if he was, if there was a POV of him getting arrested, I didn't know about it. Obviously, the way I remember finding out this information is from the letter that Darnay gets and then saying, "Hey, I'm going back," which kind of shows like that he's an honorable man. But again, yeah. I still don't really like at this point. I'm not like, oh man, Darnay's gonna get screwed because he's a part of the ever. Like, you know, I hadn't that information See, I that did. he's high level. And this point, I was I like, this seems like a dumb decision danger. on Darnay's part. Like, yeah. I get honor and everything, but you're gonna get caught, bro. Like, See, yeah, and I didn't get that part, so I'm like, yeah. what's the danger? I thought it was maybe just dangerous just because it's reckless out there, not because of who he was. Yeah. So anyway, I missed that. So anyway, Darnay goes to Paris, um, and then also in between this... Lori, the bank that he works for, he's like, I need to go to Paris as well, um, which we haven't really talked about Lori here. He's kind of sprinkled through. And then we also haven't talked about there's there's a lady too. Um, dang, I should know her name. But anyway, she's like a servant lady. And she's more in the very beginning when Lori goes to that hotel and she's like kind of taking care of Lucy. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. anyway, she is going to go with Jerry I think it's Jerry. Am I saying his name right? Croucher? Is, I keep saying Jerry. I feel like his name is Johnny. J it is Jerry. Okay. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. This is exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. <laughs> like, I don't know, dude. There's just enough I don't characters know to where is. you can forget them. <laughs> <laughs> but, because there's really not that many characters, but there's it's like 10. Anyway, so she's also sprinkled in here, but essentially Lori, the bank he works for, he would go back and forth through from France to Paris, so he's going to go back as well. So there's kind of like a crew going now. So, but they're all for different reasons. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Darnay arrives in Paris. The revolutionaries, they immediately arrest him solely because he's an immigrant, which I'm like, that's such a dagger. <laughs> um, and then Lucy and Manette make their way to Paris in hopes of saving him. So I guess somehow they knew. I lost this disconnect, too, of how they knew he was going to be in trouble. Like or, Anyway, Darnay, he stays in prison for a year and three months. Manette uses his clout because, remember, he was like someone who was wrongly imprisoned. We still don't really know why. Um, to this point, and so he's seen as like a hero, so he uses that to get him out. Um, 
Uh, Darnay receives an acquittal, but at the same time he's arrested again. So a little bit while, like a little bit after that, he gets arrested again. Um, this time the charges come from Defarge and his wife. Um, so this is when we're like, okay, I thought they were kind of on our team, and now it's like, wait, why are they not on our team? And I'm just yeah. so confused at this point because I thought everybody's on the same team here. Um, Car- Sydney Carton's going to arrive with a plan to rescue Darnay, and this is where I got more of a grasp on who Sydney Carton was. Before this, he was yeah. very elusive for me. Yeah. Um, and, uh, he obtains the help of John Barsad, um, and this is like, I didn't grasp any of this. So that guy who was a spy, who was so obviously a spy in the wine shop, he gets his help. Um, and this is the guy at one point in the book that's like denying. He's like, I'm not a spy. I was never a spy. Well, right? so he's saying that because his name is Solomon Pross, which is the long lost brother of Miss Pross. So Miss Pross is the girl who said, I couldn't remember her name. So she's the one that's always complaining right. about her brother. That's he left right. her with all the money and whatever. That's right. And so I picked up that that was him. And so he's like just trying to play behind the scenes as an English spy. And so she comes in and like passes him because they're actually trying to get wine. She is with, I think, Jerry. And she's like, that's my brother. Yeah. And he's like, I don't know her. Stop on her. And she's like, why would you do this to me? (laughs) She like freaks out. She just absolutely cannot pick up on the fact that his life is in danger and being exposed like this. Exactly. So anyway, he's able to get some dirt to help um, Sydney kind of come up with this plan. Which, again, I still am like, well, I mean, what the heck is Sydney going to do? And honestly, at this point, I kind of thought Sydney was trying to savage Darnay. I'm going to be honest with you. like, And I think that's – I don't think he writes it in that with that intention, but because of the, the information that I was grabbing and then the information I wasn't grabbing, it was like, dang, Sydney's about to savage him, bro. Yeah. Somehow. But anyway, because at this point, I thought the, the, the spy – I thought it was the other way. I thought the guy was spying right. not to help England but to hurt England. So that's yeah. where I lost that too. But anyway – so at Darnay's second trial, there Defarge gives a letter that he found that was in Manette's old jail cell, which tells Manette's story of why he was arrested and essentially and put in prison for all those years, for 18 years, and mm-hmm. then forced him to go into shoemaking. And essentially it's because um, Evermond, uh, so Darnay's uncle and his father asked for Manette's medical assistance. They asked him to tend to a woman whom one of the brothers had raped. And her brother, the same brother, had been uh, stabbed. So, um, anyway. So, fearing that Manette might report the misdeeds, the Evermonds had him arrested. So, Manette goes, helps this lady who was raped by one of Darnay's, is either his father or his uncle. I guess they didn't clarify that. They put him in prison for that. And I remember that scene. Yeah, and they both die. The boy and the girl both die. Correct? No. I think the girl dies, but anyway, the child lives. The child and this lives. is what I did not, like, I didn't grasp any of this the tra- because of the who the child Darnay. is. No. Who's the child? So Darnay is, oh, that would have been crazy. Yeah. No. The child is Madame Defarge. The wine shop, like, that's why she's, like, all about, now. Nah, we just got, we got to kill these people. Gotcha. Which makes so much more sense now that right, I know right, that. Because right, I'm right, like, right. dude, this girl is, like, I mean, she's a problem. Yeah. Like she's trying to kill everybody. She was a major problem. She was a huge problem. She was problem. a witch. Oh, for sure. And so, uh, upon hearing the story, the jury condemns Darnay for his crimes of his ancestors and sentenced him to die within 24 hours. That night at the Defage's wine shop, Carton overhears Madame Defage plotting to have Lucy and her, um, her daughter, so Darnay's daughter, um, executed as well because they're like on the same lines. I mean, she's letting nobody Go from the Evermont the family ever too. live. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Who everyone loves Lucy. Um, so Carton arranges for the Manette's <laughs> immediate departure from France, uh, and then visits Darnay in prison. He tricks him into changing clothes with him, and after uh, an explanation, he drugs his friend unconscious. So he drugs Darnay to kind of get him out of there um, because he and Sydney look so much alike and. Sydney already has, like, documentation to where he can leave, no problem. Somehow right. already has that out. Um, and so, anyway, he just switches places with him. Because, and as this is going on, I'm like, bro, there is no way Sydney's about to get himself killed for this guy. For no, but just because Lucy loves him? So, anyway, um, Barsad, so Miss Pross's brother, who's a spy now, carries him out, um... To an awaiting coach, uh, Carton is going to be disi- disguised as Darnay, awaits execution. Lucy, Dr. Manette, their child, they get out of Paris. 
Uh, Madame Defage arrives at Lucy's apartment. Um, she finds Miss Pross. They get into a scuffle. Defage gets killed um, with a bullet from her own gun. You know, they have a little scrap there, which was kind of interesting. Uh, Sidney Carton uh, meets his death at the guillotine, and the narrator confidently asserts that Carton dies with the knowledge that he has finally um, imbued his life with meaning. So I guess, and this is what I didn't grasp either, which makes more sense why Carton was willing to do this. He just always had this vision of himself that he was a bad person. Yeah, because he was a drunk and like had yeah. no lot in life, and then Lucy kind of like made him, even though he didn't get her, he felt like she made him better. Yeah. Um, and he wanted to die like for her, but and for the man that she actually loved. And this is where, and tell me where you've heard these words before. I don't know if you caught it when you read or listened to it, but his final words before he gets his head chopped off are, it is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. Mm, I guess I've heard that. Who is that? You've heard it, dude. Is that Anakin Skywalker? <laughs> <laughs> no, dude. When in the Dark Knight Rises, when everybody thinks that Batman is dead, Gordon says it at their little funeral they have with oh, like, okay, yeah, Gordon says it, and then dude, I, I get chills just thinking about the scene where Alfred, like they all kind of walk off, and Alfred walks over to the grave of Martha and whatever Bruce Wayne's dad's name was, and he was like, I failed you. I made you a promise and I failed you. It's right after he says those words, but that's what Gordon like recites. Like he kind of says something else and then ends his little, you know, obituary speech at the funeral for Bruce mm. by saying that line. That's such a good and it's a series. great line. I mean, it's a great, it's a great series. I mean, that's probably Nolan my least on. favorite of all three of them, but Batman begins. No, that's the last one. Dark Knight rises. That one's probably my least. I mean, it's okay. great. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, no, but I mean, Dark yeah, Knight's yeah. the best and Batman begins is just, I mean, it started at all. Yeah. Um, and The Dark Knight Rises also did have some things that were kind of like, eh. But anyway. Yeah. No, I, I didn't mean it. I mean, that's my favorite Nolan film. Which one? The Dark Knight. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's either that or Interstellar. I mean, there's so many. I mean, there's so many. And now with Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer I, I mean, so I can't. Good. That was honestly a reckless statement for me to say that. I mean, I guess it's not because Dark Knight's so good, but I really would have to think about it. Yeah. And then you go back and you have Memento and. Uh, See, Memento was good, but I would never give that the best. But um, Yeah, it wouldn't be the best. The other one, the Magician movie. The Prestige. That one is so good. So dude. that's up there. It's probably I love top the three. The Prestige, yeah. dude. And then you have Inception, obviously. Oh. Which that one's kind of like. It's so good, dude, but it's almost overrated at this point in comparison to his other movies. Like, yeah. if you tell me that Inception is the best Nolan movie, I'm like... Have you seen the other ones? Yeah. I mean, even even Dunkirk is good. I, I don't like good. it nearly as much, but it is good. But I haven't even seen the other one that you said the the audio was just a problem. Oh, Tenet? Yeah, I haven't, but I've heard it's really good. Yeah, I and I think they fixed the audio since it's, like, out. Like, if you can go rent it or buy it on, like, a streaming platform. But, dude, in the movie, I mean, I hope you weren't trying to hear the dialogue because... <laughs> All you could hear is just, <laughs> which kind of in Oppenheimer was a problem a couple times. I saw yeah. it in IMAX. I heard it was better in like standard viewing, but I saw it in IMAX too. Or we saw it in how whatever you were supposed to see it in. You were supposed to see it in like the seventy millimeter, like something other than Maybe IMAX. We, I don't know. I can't remember. I'd have to ask Lexi, but, but I loved it. Oppenheimer. Either I way, Nolan's it. always kind of had like people hate on him for his the audio mixing, which I don't even know if he's really responsible for that. But it would just in Oppenheimer, bro. There'd be that loud background noise of just like <laughs> of like Adams just and then there'd be somebody talking, and I'm like, what is he saying? I don't know because all I can hear is the atom bomb going off. <laughs> like, yeah, it's just crazy. But anyway, that was like, dude. The very beginning and the very end of Tale of Two Cities is legendary good. Yeah. But the 95% in between, I was just struggling to keep yeah. up. With I feel like if happening. I read this book again, which I think one day I actually probably will. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's I a seriously classic. do think I yeah, will. for sure. Um, I think I'll appreciate it a lot more just because now I know, okay, what's supposed to happen. Because yeah. like and I'll actually read, read it next time. Yeah. Like, I there were so again. many things that happened that it's like, wow, that's, that's a good twist. Mm -hmm. That's a good setup. That's a good twist. He did a good job of introducing this character. It's just me not realizing that that's who that character was. Me not connecting the pieces on who they were. Um, and all of their connections in between exactly. each other. Because like, that so was many, the biggest thing that I did There's so didn't many cool grasp. connections, and that's yeah. what the book is based off of. Yeah. Um, but again, I think a lot of it does have to do with the writing style back then compared to now. I mean, there's just been so many developments just in the English language and how we use it compared yeah. to, I mean, how Charles Dickens would sound even right now. 
yeah. if he was teleported to 2023. So, right, yeah. But I can see why this is, like, a classic. Yeah. You know, um, like, I, I get it. Like, I'm not, like, yeah. like Picture of Dorian Gray, I don't get it. You know what I mean? This just, one, I get it. That book was stupid. Yeah. Dorian book, Gray sucked. I didn't like it. This book, I did like it. Yeah. You know, especially, and I like it more after doing this because it's like, all right, I can flesh out what I didn't know and what I missed. And But after, like, knowing what actually happens, I'm like, okay, that was a good book. Like, right. genuinely a good book. I just missed it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I totally agree. And, like, I went and kind of did a little spark note journey chat gpt to a few questions about it which who knows how reliable that is but i did appreciate it a little bit more but i didn't like there were a couple things i grasped more once i went back and like read some stuff online yeah but for the most part it was just like stuff that i had like i had like put in my brain but just didn't connect the dots as to why certain connections were important and who certain characters were like dude the whole thing you just said about Madame Defarge being... Bro, I didn't get that at all. I Dude. That her being... I mean, that, it makes sense. If you hadn't said that just now, I would never know it. I would have never known it either if I didn't, like, read it, like, in a summary. Yeah. So, so, I mean, and again, part of it, I think... I mean, you and neither you or I are really accustomed to, like, super classic, classical no, styles of it, writing. So, I think no. that's part of it is, like... It kind of makes you realize that nowadays the way things are written... And who knows if this is better or worse, but things are just... Or even direct. a book that's, like pretty complicated like three body problem or the stormlight archive that has a lot of different tethers and different connected dots like there's just there's never met hard metaphors where you're not sure what's going on like yeah. he's spoken metaphors for like pages sometimes yeah yeah where he never broke the metaphor so it's like is yeah. this a metaphor or is this, actually is this whole happening? book a metaphor like <laughs> yeah. did none of this happen <laughs> yeah um but yeah, i mean overall like and now after going through it right there, like there were a couple of things like obviously that like connected the dots even more for me. But I think the biggest dagger for me was just audibling it. Like I'll have to be more careful in the future of doing audible on s classics. Like it seemed like the proper yeah. thing to do with audible was hit classics. And I'll still do that to a degree, but I'll have to do a little more like digging into like like the the themes and the style the writing style of the book like if if i yeah. read oh there's a lot of metaphors in this book i'm not audibling it yeah. i will say i struggle. think the best thing to audible honestly is thriller or like a mystery mm, yeah um like i've audibled a couple stephen kings and then just co a couple other like free audible like original yeah. books that like i i think are i mean they were solid i liked them but they were like more just for my ride like when i was driving a lot um and yeah, they're they're just more of those mysteries that are set like in Boston or what? Yeah, they're set in a scenario like a scenario where you don't need a whole lot of context and visualization. Like you can picture right. it in your mind already. I just said Boston right. in, in 2010. Like you can already figure out what that looks like. And again, there's just not like the hard metaphors. It's just a story. Right. And that's just way easier. And it's Lucy and John. It's not <laughs> names that. That's where fantasy gets tough, man. Is like you're hearing all these names, and it's like I can't visualize, like especially even in, I guess not as many in the Shadow of the Gods, but there were some though. Like but Don in Stormlight, Shard, I mean, can you imagine just audibling that and like having to hear those characters' names? I wouldn't know what it's like looked like because I still don't even know how they're actually pronounced. I don't know how the main character how is. I just said Rising, Ryan. Ryan, yeah. I mean, I mean, I just replaced the S with an A. I was like, I'm not going Risen every time I read her name because I don't know what that is. Like, R-Y-S-N. Yeah. I'd love to hear Sanderson say it. I need to find something where he talks That's about Don Shard. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you can audible it and see. I mean, that is the only th reason why if you read a book and then audible, it's like, okay, now I know, I guess, theoretically how the author wants it spoken or right. pronounced. But Like, I mean, Jasna. Brandon says Yasna. Hmm. And it's That's just like, cut. okay, hurts me. fine. If her name's Yasna, spell it with a Y. Why are you spelling it with a J in a book? How am I supposed to know that it's Yasna? Dude, it's the it's the culture of Elithkar. Elithkar. Yeah, but I mean, I just so love anyway, how we still talk about Stormlight in every single podcast. Yeah, it's it's what we can relate to back to for you. I mean, I think as we like continue, we'll have more stuff to go back onto. I mean, I can't wait for you to read First Law, dude. I can't, I can't wait. wait for you to read the Silmarillion. That is coming up soon. Yeah. So I guess we're towards the end of this. We're like updates on where we're at. Like I'm, I randomly started the Sword of Kagan or Kagan, however you pronounce that, and it's great, dude. You would yeah. really like yeah, it. I'm excited it's really to hear good. you 
talk um, about that one. So I'll have I'm doing like a, something different. Jesse and I are trying some different things out content wise to just to see if anyone cares honestly, and yeah, uh, maybe we'll they see. do. Um, if you do care, definitely subscribe. And yeah, like, we need to get better at that. Comment. Please like and subscribe. Please comment. We're getting like yeah. not a lot of comments. We want to see like yeah. if these are just bots watching and liking our videos. So comment what you think, even if you think this sucks. Like tell us what kind not, of books like you would like to hear, yeah. what kind of stuff you like or don't like in our reviews. Like should we do more of, you know, non-spoiler stuff? Should we not do the long summaries we're doing? Do you like the long form? Do you like the shorter clips we've done or shorter reviews? So like... Let us know if you're watching yeah. these, even if you know us personally, because maybe that's half of our viewers right now. But let us know what's good and what's actually this like isn't like a high school engaged. like project. We're not doing one of these. Like we're going to continue to post two of these a week. So like, yeah, we're going to stack up content. So we don't want to do stuff that no one cares about. But anyway, um, we've got the wager coming up as well. The wager. We'll have someone else on that. And then yeah. how I'm doing the uh, since Jesse hasn't read the Sword of Kagan, like I'll do a, a non spoiler review on here with him. I'm sure, but. I'm doing my own thing where I'm just recording as I read, like, my reaction. Because, you know, just to kind of see. So it'll be a shorter thing. We might just put that on shorts, probably, just because of the way it's formatted. Yeah. And it's a little quicker thing. It's probably, like, two or three minutes total. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I mean, we, we have a lot of exciting stuff coming up with some more historical stuff. Yeah. Um, getting into the similar Silmarillion. And Which dude, is try spelling, dude. I tried spelling that and texting it to you, and I just gave up. Oh, I can spell it. I mean, I can now. I don't know why I didn't know there was an L before the M. I was saying Similarillion. I didn't mm -hmm. realize it was Sil. And so that's why I'm like, dude, I can't find it. But anyway, <laughs> but that Rhythm of War obviously is coming up too. We might yep. do some like murder bot in between or before or after. Who knows? Yep. Probably um, hit a couple of these smaller ones too, like Slaughterhouse. I think I'll hit that. Slaughterhouse yeah. 5. I need to get that. Um,. um but we got some good stuff coming up. Rise and fall. We're gonna do some Third Reich. Uh, break it up into some stuff. Yeah. Break it up into five parts. We'll break and let us know if you're watching this and you've read all of the books I'm about to list off. Let us know if the next like series we should tackle is the Red Rising series, or if it's what are the other ones we discussed? Um, Red Rising. We could reread First Law trilogy. Honestly, I would love. Yeah. Um, Mistborn is Mistborn. another one. So let's just stick with those three. Do you think we should read the Red Rising series, Mistborn, or if we should uh, dive into the First Law series? Um, mm. And then, yeah, history-wise, we got a lot of stuff coming up. I'm still going to be diving into some Founding Fathers over the uh, next few months. Um, we're going to hit Napoleon, um, which is kind of around that time as well. So a lot of early American history, some French history. Um, and, yeah. I might finally hit, I mean, I'm such a Star Wars fan, and I, have, I still haven't reviewed any Star Wars books, so I might hit a little Star Wars review. I'm not going to reread them, but I'm going to kind of, I think I'm going to kind of go through some of the books I've read and, like, rate them and just talk just about a little bit. list of the ones that are, like, you can do S through F tier. Like yeah, I probably will. Read. Um, but, yeah, for real, comment, like, what kind of videos, like, should we do more tier lists? Should we do the in-depth reviews um, and all that kind of stuff? Uh, I also want to get into the, the Jade War stuff, man. Oh, dude, such a good. Is series. it called the Jade War trilogy? It's called the Greenbone Saga. Greenbone Saga. I mean, they all have Jade in the name, and it's not called Jade anything. The series. So I mean. Yeah. Well, because the man, not to get into it, the people who wear Jade are called like Greenbone Warriors. Oh, uh, dude, do you consider yourself so, a Greenbone Warrior? Dude, I, and I couldn't be because I'm not ethnically Kakanese or whatever it's called. What's it's like Kakanese? An it's like just an ethnicity there. They're the only ones who can like harness jade. Dude, Except there's this new drug that comes on the market. That's kind of racist. It is, but there's a new drug that, I mean, when you're Asian, it doesn't count, you know? As right. long as you're not white and you're racist, it doesn't count. <laughs> but um, there's like a new drug. Like the premise of the first book is, you know, there's these drug cartels, or these like, these crime families that are bloodline to where they, like when they put jade on their body, um, it just makes them faster or stronger. Like that's, it's like light, very light magic use. But then there's this new drug that comes on the market to where if you take it, it makes it to where you can harness Jade abilities too. Mm -hmm. But obviously there's like <laughs> terrible side effects. It's, it's like, uh, it reminds me of Batman Begins when, you know, they're like, <laughs> like <laughs> going crazy over that like mist stuff. Yeah. So like there's like hardcore side effects like that. Um, too, yeah. but then also there's the downside of like, oh, well, if you can't anyway. Yeah. So, but it's, I mean, it's, if you've watched any of our other videos, the Green Mode Saga, I think is the most underrated series. I mean, it is newer, but 
it's starting to get a little bit more talk about it, but I mean, it's my it's my favorite series of all time. Yeah, and I've read Sanderson, which I mean, so I mean that's saying a lot. But it's it's just a different type of story. Yeah, obviously way different. It's almost not really. Fa- I mean, uh, there's small fantastical elements, but it's more just normal. I'll right. say crime fantasy thriller. Right. But. All right. Cool. Anything else on tail? No, I'm curious to see what next we go to in the classical fiction because I'm sure we'll keep this segment going. Yeah. Um, I guess Slaughterhouse Five consider we consider yeah. that one. I mean, we got Grapes of Wrath maybe or yeah. Um, like, I forgot to say I got East of Eden. That East was one of, of the Eden, thrift books I got. One. So, but I feel like we. I mean, October's coming up, man. Not to like put other things on pause, but we gotta read some horror. Some like I'm down. I mean, I, I can't mean? think of a single horror book that I it, like know of. The Stand, uh, dude, it's ginormous. I'm down with the I Stand. Know. I'm Stand's down with the Stand. Even bigger than it. Yeah, or but maybe. the Stand, like I've been wanting to read for a yeah. while. That's I mean, like I'm well, I think too. that's one of his highest rated books of all it time. Is. Um, yeah, that and it both are. I mean, I've heard that as far as like scary, I've heard Pet Cemetery, Carrie, those are like so scary. Yeah. But anyway, we if you have some horror recommendations. Definitely leave those because I'm I'm yeah. down for a little horror. I mean, we did we did drag. I feel like I said horror and it sounded like I had autism when I said that. So I want to <laughs> threw just an go L in there. Or something. <laughs> dude, I was rewatching one of our episodes and I said I couldn't say Dave Portnoy. Correct, I said it like Dave Portnoy. <laughs> so I want it, Dave. I know you're probably watching this. I want you to know I can say Portnoy, and I know yeah. how your name is said. I just sometimes, sometimes we just get so excited and ahead of ourselves we can't even talk. Yeah, sometimes I sound like I'm. I don't have all my chromosomes, but I promise I do. No. Um, but anyway, if you have any good ones, I'm always down for a horror because we loved uh, Dracula. That was, I mean, yeah, that was it's great. Honestly, it's my one favorite, of my favorite book. classic I've read for oh, sure yeah, by it's far. Great. So good. Um, so good. All right, cool. Well, that's, that's it for this one. Um, I'm Zoe Saldana. This is Dave Bautista, and we will see you next time.